In this video, we continue talking about what happens when we put different materials together. So this is the band diagram of a piece of insulator next to a piece of semiconductor, and this could be silicon in this case. We have an applied electric field. This electric field could be built in or external. The question is, how does the electric field affect the two materials? So for uh, the semiconductor, what's going to happen is that we will have a depletion region forming uh, near the interface. This depletion region leads to a uniform uh, ionic charge, and this uniform ionic charge leads to the uh, quadratic bending of uh, bands in the semiconductors. So this is what's happening here. Uh, the Insulator is also going to have band bending, but it's going to be linear, and so we will see band tilting. So when there is an interface between an insulator and a semiconductor, we see bending in both of them. This bending is going to happen to accommodate different Fermi levels in the flat band diagram as we go to the equilibrium band diagram, and could also be due to the application of an external field in non-equilibrium. Uh, the question of how uh, V oxide and Vs, in this case, the, different, the difference in bending, the amount of bending between the two materials, is not easy to answer and it requires a deeper study. But one, one rule we can use uh, to help us answer this is Gauss boundary conditions at the interface, which say that the uh, permittivity of silicon multiplied by the electric field of silicon is going to equal the permittivity of the insulator, which in this case is an oxide, multiplied by the electric field in it. So basically the electrical di displacement in material 1 is going to equal the electrical displacement in material 2 at the interface. So just here and just here we have an equivalence between the two. And so this is going to allow us to actually do a lot of great work when we start looking at the MOS capacitor. Now what happens when we have a metal or a conductor in, uh, connected to either an insulator or a semiconductor actually, but let's first look at an insulator. What's going to happen is that if there is some kind of voltage drop, some kind of electric field, whether it's built in or externally imposed, the entire voltage drop, the entire electric field is going to fall upon the, uh, the insulator. So why does that happen? Because the metal has infinite conductivity and so it refuses to have any voltage drop. And so any voltage drop is going to fall upon the insulator completely. This is actually very, very, very logical because if you have a circuit like this and you have a voltage drop Vs, and you have a, an insulator here, an open circuit, and metals here, which are perfect conductors, then Vs is going to fall entirely upon the, uh, the insulator. In fact, even if you have something with a finite resistance here, like a semiconductor, still the entire voltage drop will fall upon it, which leads to the discussion of interfaces between semiconductors and metals. And so the interface between semiconductor and insulator and metal and insulator are important because they will lead to the discussion of uh, the MOS capacitor and then the MOSFET. But interfaces between metals and semiconductors are also critically important because when we look at devices, we will find that we have to make contacts between metals and semiconductors whenever we wire together multiple transistors. So for example, in a CMOS inverter, this is how it looks like. It's two devices, two transistors, and they are connected using metal wires. So these metal wires are going to make contact with semiconductors. And so we have to understand what happens when a metal makes a contact with an N-type semiconductor or a P-type semiconductor. What happen, happens when we uh, contact the PN junction at its two terminals so that we can use it in a circuit? Because what happens is not trivial. And so we have here uh, the band diagrams of a uh, semiconductor to metal uh, interface. And obviously the semiconductor here is n-type because the Fermi level is above the middle of the band gap. So this is n-type silicon. And we begin by drawing the uh, flat band diagram, which is the top left band diagram. So in the flat band diagram, the uh, 
vacuum level is constant. We use the work function of uh, the metal to draw uh, the Fermi level. Notice that the metal does not have a significant uh, electron affinity because we don't know, we don't care where the conduction band edge is. We only care about the Fermi level. We also use the uh, electron affinity of silicon to uh, draw the conduction band edge EC. And then we use the band gap to draw the uh, valence band edge EV. And using the level of doping, we draw the position of E Fermi for silicon. And we notice that we have two E Fermis here, which means that this is not an equilibrium band diagram, which we know because this is a flat band diagram rather than an equilibrium band diagram. So to transform this into an equilibrium band diagram, uh, the two Fermi levels have to move by an amount of QVS. The metal, the metal Fermi level is not going to move because there can be no voltage drop on the metal, whether this is built in or external. So all the moving is going to be done by the semiconductor. These points are going to be pinned in order to preserve the electron affinity rule so that the electron affinity just right of the interface is electron affinity of silicon and so that the, the vacuum level is continuous. And what's going to happen is that the uh, band diagram of silicon far away from the interface is going to return to its flat band levels because we have electric and neutral zones far away from the interface. Around the interface, we will see some degree of bending, which is nonlinear, quadratic. We know why it is quadratic. And the amount of bending is going to be QVS, which can be obtained from, uh, from actually the flat band diagram. QVS can actually be obtained as the difference between the work functions of the metal and uh, the semiconductor in this case. So there is a depletion region near the interface, and it's carrying positive ions in this case because we have donors. And so it's going to cause an electric field heading from the semiconductor into the metal. This is going to cause a drift of electrons from the metal to the semiconductor. So it's going to cause a drift in this direction. This drift of electrons is going to be perfectly balanced out by the fusion of electrons from the semiconductor into the corresponding level of the metal, so that at thermal equilibrium, the two currents are going to cancel out and there will be zero current flow uh, in either direction. Now, if we apply a uh, potential, a positive potential to the semiconductor side of the interface, this means we are pushing the Fermi level of the semiconductor down by as much as we apply an external potential VR. So we have the Fermi level of the semiconductor dropping by QVR. Now, this is a non-thermal equilibrium diagram, but let's see what's happening here. So what's happening here is that the drift of electrons from metal to a semiconductor is not going to increase or decrease. It's going to remain the same as it is at equilibrium level. The reason is that the barrier, the energy barrier that electrons see in order to reach the conduction band edge of silicon at the interface is the same regardless of the applied voltage. It's still the same. So this drift current is still the same, right? So even though we have an electric field from the outside that is now uh, moving from the uh, semiconductor into the metal, trying to aid carriers flowing from the metal into the semiconductor, they're not going to be able to pull in more electrons because the barrier is the same to these electrons. On the other hand, we have pushed the conduction band edge of the semiconductor down. Thus, the level that is corresponding to the level uh, of the first level of the metal we see is going to be higher than it is in equilibrium. And therefore, the concentration of electrons here drops and it drops exponentially. And therefore, the diffusion current from the uh, semiconductor into the metal is going to drop exponentially. And so what we see here is that the current from the metal to the semiconductor is not increasing, while the current from the semiconductor to the metal is decreasing. And so what we see here is the flow of a, of a very small current equal to the, um, uh, to the equilibrium drift current from metal to semiconductor. This is bad. We don't see current flow, right? On the other hand, if we apply positive potential to the metal side, then we are applying negative potential to the semiconductor side and raising its Fermi level.
Now, the drift current from the metal to the semiconductor is still going to be using the same amount of, uh, of carriers because we are still seeing the same energy barrier. However, we have raised the conduction band edge and thus raised the concentration of electrons at the uh, semiconductor side of the interface exponentially. This allows us to raise the diffusion of carriers from the semiconductor into the metal exponentially. And so what we are seeing here is that if we have a semiconductor and the metal, if we apply a positive potential to the semiconductor, we see very small current flowing. If we apply a positive potential to the metal, we see a huge current flowing. So what's happening here is an action very similar to a diode. And this is called a Schottky diode, and it has a rectifying effect. This is extremely undesirable when you want to have a metal to semiconductor contact along these lines, when we want to form wires. Because what you want to have here is an ohmic contact, preferably with a very small uh, resistance. You want to be able to conduct a signal in both the positive direction and the negative direction without uh, introducing any um, clipping to it, right? And this is not what's happening in this case. So when you need to have an ohmic contact between semiconductors and metals, what you have to do is you have to very heavily dope the semiconductors. And so if you look at these two band diagrams, the difference between them, this is a rectifying or shot key band uh, contact, and this is an ohmic contact, which is what we would want most of the time. And the main difference here is that we have very heavy doping for the semiconductor, bringing the Fermi level much closer to the conduction band edge. So again, we can move from the flat band diagram to the equilibrium band diagram, where the two current components cancel out. In the forward direction, where we apply a negative potential uh, to the uh, semiconductor, we'll still have a huge uh, f diffusion current flowing from the semiconductor to the metal. So that's not a problem. It wasn't a problem. It is still, it is still not a problem. But when we apply a positive potential to the semiconductor, we pull down uh, the Fermi level. And in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, band diagram, we saw that we still had the same uh, energy barrier to electrons fr moving from the metal to the semiconductor. But what's happening here is that as we pull down the conduction band edge of the semiconductor, we are also making this narrower. We're making the depletion region narrower around the interface. So the bending is much, much steeper in the semiconductor, leading to a much narrower depletion region. This allows current or charges to flow comfortably from the metal to the semiconductor using a, a phenomenon called tunneling. And, and tunneling is a quantum effect uh, through which charges like electrons from the metal manage to cross an insulator, even though they do not have enough energy to get over the energy barrier that they face to move into this insulator. And the reason is that the insulator is thin enough for us to observe wave-like properties of the electrons on the conductor side. So the short of this is that when you need to form a metal contact with, for example, p-type silicon, you can't contact the p-type silicon directly. You will have a rectifying effect. What you should do is you should form a region of P plus heavily doped P type and then contact this using metal and then you will have a, an ohmic contact which conducts in both directions.